All right, it's good to see you be here this evening. Look forward to our time of worship together. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 442. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Sing, O earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory. Strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guard his children. In his arms he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful song. Praise him, praise him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, for our sins He suffered and bled and died. He, our rock, our hope of eternal salvation, hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows, Love unbounded, wonderful, deep, and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with hosannas ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. That really is well written, isn't it? Giving glory to Christ and all of His attributes. Let's take our Bibles and we're going to turn to Ezekiel chapter 48 which is the final chapter of this book that we have been journeying through for some time. Ezekiel chapter 48. I love how this book ends, giving all the glory to Christ as Ezekiel was sitting there in captivity. The Lord was encouraging him that he would bring the people back into the land again and establish them not for their sake but for his sake and uh, that through that people the Lord Jesus Christ would come in the flesh God's son that's why he preserved Israel the promise he made to Abraham was he would give them a land he would give them a people and he would give them him a seed in which all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And Paul very clearly tells us in Galatians 3 that seed is Christ. That's what all the scriptures about points to Christ. So here in Ezekiel chapter 48, we have some instructions given as to how the land would be divided up once Israel was back in the land. It says here, now these are the names of the tribes from the north end to the coast of the way of Pethmon, as one goeth to Hamath, Hazarahanon, the border of Damascus, northward to the coast of Hamath, for these are his sides, east and west, a portion for Dan. 
So all of this redistribution of the land had in, in view some of the tribes. Here will be seven out of the ten northern tribes that had been taken into captivity. The land remained theirs. It was to be theirs forever. But there would be a redividing of the land. It would not be as it was before. And here it says, by the border of Dan from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Asher. And by the border of Asher from the east side even unto the west side, a portion for Naphtali. And by the border of Naphtali from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Manasseh. And by the border of Manasseh from the east side unto the west side, a portion for Ephraim. And by the border of Ephraim, from the east side, even unto the west side, a portion for Reuben. And by the border of Reuben, from the east side, unto the west side, a portion for Judah. You're always going to see Judah in there. Because that's the tribe that the Lord promised that his son would come through, the seed of David. It says, by the border of Judah, from the east side unto the west side, shall be the offering which he shall offer of five and twenty thousand reeds in breadth and in length as one of the other parts, from the east side unto the west side, and the sanctuary will be in the midst of it. So here it's talking about the rebuilding of that temple. It would be a sanctuary that would be in the midst of Judah. And we know that when Israel did come back in the land, Zerubbabel rebuilt the temple and it lasted right on down to the time of Christ. That's the temple that when the Lord was taken there as a young child for his circumcision, that the glory of the Lord entered back in. All that time it had departed, but now it was in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Like John said, we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And so, verse 9, there's a portion here that's described as the Lord's, the district of the Lord. Verse 9, and the oblation that ye shall offer unto the Lord shall be of five and twenty thousand in length and ten thousand in breadth. And for them, even for the priests, shall be this holy oblation toward the north, five and twenty thousand in length, and toward the west, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the east, ten thousand in breadth, and toward the south, five and twenty thousand in length. And the sanctuary of the Lord shall be in the midst thereof. And it shall be for the priests, that are sanctified are the sons of Zadok, which have kept my charge, which went not astray when the children of Israel went astray as the Levites went astray. And this oblation of the land that is offered shall be unto them a thing most holy by the border of the Levites. So here was a particular district that was to be set up and typified as we've already seen reading up to now in the vision that Ezekiel had, a sanctuary unto the Lord. Anything that was established on earth was to be a type and picture of the heavenly sanctuary. But again, where the, the sanctuary of the Lord was at the center of everything that was taking place. And that sanctuary represents the Lord Jesus Christ. He was made flesh and dwelt among us as John said, we beheld his glory as of the only begotten, full of grace and truth. And so here was to be also, all of this was to continue until Christ came. So there's a reestablishing of the division of the land. And notice, not all the tribes are mentioned. This is a remnant. <clears throat> there was to be a consecrated district unto the Lord. That's where the temple would have been rebuilt. And now the priests in verses 13 and 14 over against 
the border of the priests, the Levites shall have five and twenty thousand in length and ten thousand in breadth. All the length shall be five and twenty thousand, the breadth ten thousand. And they shall not sell of it, neither exchange, nor alienate the first fruits of the land, for it is holy unto the Lord. Takes them right back to the way the law had been set up in the beginning. And they were to do their ministry unto the Lord, holy, consecrated unto Him. That's a type and picture of us as believer priests today, that we have our high priest, which is Christ, and as believer priests, we serve Him, not with animal sacrifices, that's been done away, but with sacrifices of praise unto Him, is the way the writer of the Hebrews puts it. But here specifically, there would be land apportioned again for the city. Remember, the city had been destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But that land, that place called Zion, that's where that temple was to be rebuilt. And it was. Here in verses 15 through 20, it says, In the 5,000 that are left in the breadth over against the 5 and 20,000 shall be a profane place for the city, for dwelling, and for suburbs, and the city shall be in the midst thereof. So the temple was what was holy unto the Lord, but where the people would dwell all around it, it was in the center of the city that it's called here a profane place because it's where sinners dwell. And there again is a reminder there's a separation between God and His holiness and what that temple represented and the Lord Jesus Christ and the people. The only way that any can come into His presence is going to be through His Son. And these shall be measured, measures thereof, and the north side 4,500 and South side, 4,500. On the east side, 4,500. On the west side, 4,500. Notice, nothing is left to man to determine his lot. That it's where the Lord has put each one that they are to dwell. And the suburbs of the city shall be toward the north, 250, and toward the south, 250, and toward the east, 250 and toward the west 250 and the residue in length over against the oblation of the holy portion shall be 10,000 eastward and 10,000 westward and it shall be over against the oblation of the holy portion and the increase thereof shall be for food unto them that serve the city and they that serve the city shall serve it out of all the tribes of Israel the ones that remain, the remnant. And all the oblation shall be five and twenty thousand. By five and twenty thousand, he shall offer the holy oblation four square with the possession of the city. I know that a lot of these particular measurements, you'd have to go back and see exactly what the lengths and widths are, but what strikes me every time when I read that is the four square. That this is a perfect layout that God has purposed for his people to dwell. And then here we have verses 21 and 22, the portion for the prince. Remember the prince? This represents the Lord Jesus Christ. And the residue shall be for the prince on the one side and on the other of the holy oblation and of the possession of the city over against the five and twenty thousand of the oblation toward the east border and westward over against the five and twenty thousand toward the west border over against the portions for the prince and it shall be the holy oblation and the sanctuary of the house shall be in the midst thereof moreover from the possession of the Levites and from the possession of the city being in the midst of that which is the princes between the border of Judah and the border of Benjamin shall be for the prince. When Christ came after this had all been 
fulfilled and established and he entered in, they asked him by what authority he did what he did. Remember that? He went in and cleared out the temple, scourged the, the, the money changers and turned the tables over and they were appalled. Well, guess what? That was his portion. That was his father's house. It had been allotted to him. And yet, the scriptures say he came unto his own, his own received him not. But it didn't change the fact that all of that was about him and his glory and honor. And then, verses 23 to 29, we've seen the seven northern tribes. Here is where we see now the five southern tribes. In verses 23 to 29, as for the rest of the tribes from the east side unto the west side, Benjamin shall have a portion. You may ask, you say, well, I thought that when Assyria came and took the ten tribes into captivity that they disappeared. No, there was a remnant that the Lord preserved even in the land. And their heritage was what the Lord had given him. So he had those seven in the north, and now you have these five here in the south. It says, by the border of Benjamin, from the east side unto the west side, Simeon shall have a portion. And by the border of Simeon, from the east side unto the west side, Issachar, a portion. And by the border of Issachar, even the east side of the, uh, unto the west side, Zebulon, a portion. And by the border of Zebulon, from the east side unto the west side, Gad apportioned. And by the border of Gad, at the south side, southward, the border shall be even from Tamar unto the waters of Strife in Kadesh, and to the river toward the great sea. This is the land which ye shall divide by lot unto the tribes of Israel for inheritance. And these are their portion, saith the Lord God. Here's where we see the faithfulness of God, that even though these heathen armies had come in and ravaged the land, whether the Assyrians or the Babylonians, yet the Lord purposed that that land be reestablished and that the, the people that were the remnant should have their place once again, where the Lord had divided it by lot, the lot is cast, and the, and the disposing thereof is of the Lord. Here again is a reminder of what Paul wrote there in Acts, that the bounds of our habitation are determined by the Lord. Now, in verses 30 to 34, we see then this city described. Again, remember, the city was Jerusalem, but it was a type and picture of the church, of the heavenly Jerusalem, and here it says, these are the goings out of the city on the north side, 4,500 measures, and the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Sounds a little bit like what John saw in Revelation, where each one of those gates represented the tribe of Israel. But it's a spiritual Israel, and the patriarchs in the Old Testament represent the the church, remember the four and twenty elders, twenty-four elders that, that, that are represented in the book of Revelation, where you've got twelve from the Old Testament, and you've got the twelve apostles in the New, twelve and twelve equals twenty-four. So these were the ones upon whom the very church of the Lord Jesus Christ would be founded, because the promise was given to them, but, but through them, the promise was for the seed, which is Christ. And so the gates of the city shall be after the names of the tribes of Israel. Three gates northward, one gate of Reuben, one gate of Judah, one gate of Levi. And at the east side, 4,503 gates and one gate of Joseph, one gate of Benjamin, one gate of Dan. And at the south side, 4,500 measures and three gates, one gate of Simeon, one gate of Issachar, one gate of Zebulon. At the west side, 4,500 with their three gates, one gate of Gad, one gate of Asher, and one gate of Naphtali. So here again we see where this city would serve as a memorial. Really, these are 
These are memorial gates for each one of these patriarchs and a reminder of the faithfulness of God in keeping and doing what he said he would. And as I said, we can get over to Revelation 21, you see a similar presentation there of the heavenly Jerusalem. That's why I say these are types and pictures of what God would do in the new Jerusalem, which Paul described, that which is from above, where Christ is the head of his church and the priests are those that are ordained to serve him. But now this to sum this all up in verse 35, what's the name of the city? This is why I say this is symbolic. It says it was round about 18,000 measures and the name of the city from that day shall be what? The Lord is there. What day? Well, the day when Christ would enter in. That portion where he's the prince and he would come. What does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. This is another way of stating it. The Lord is there. When Christ came, he entered into this temple and possessed it, owned it, even though the children of Israel turned thumbs down on him. And in time, he destroyed it. Because, as he said, destroy this temple in three Days, I'll raise it up again. That's who he is. He's the Lord. All this has to do with him. Everything we've read here going through Ezekiel points to him. And even down to the name of the city being the Lord is there. This, this name to me tells of complete satisfaction. That what God said would be accomplished, he did. And men, armies, nations, all they did was serve his purpose. You couldn't take something and blow it up like was taking place when the Lord brought these armies down there, scattering the people. The land was desolate for 70 years and then put it back together in a meaningful way. But that's what God did. He always has had his remnant and... Uh, what he has done in, in scattering nations and men to the, to the winds, yet in his time, he will always reestablish order. And that order has to do with the Lord Jesus Christ and what he purposed in him. Beautiful book, beautiful prophecy. And as I said, we can get to the end and think, you know, probably could go back through it again and learn a whole lot more. But... Guess what? You have the Bible. You can do that. I encourage you to read and study it and look at some of these things. They say gold. You won't find it on the surface. So if you're just reading pell mell, get through it. You know, you won't see anything. But dig in. Gold is to be dug out. And that by the Spirit of God. And I know this. There's a whole lot more of Christ in here than what I've been able to point you to. But we have the Word. So let's look to the Lord. <clears throat> Gracious Father, I thank you for bringing us through this wonderful prophecy of Ezekiel. Many things we can't even begin to comprehend. It's a mysterious word that you've given us, but it's for our learning and our instruction. But I'm thankful that in all of it, it declares your glory and the person of your son and what you accomplished in bringing him into this world. I'm thankful that there is that heavenly city, there is that new Jerusalem that represents the body of Christ and everyone is there that you have so purposed and that Christ is redeemed and you've justified. What a glorious hope we have even as we live out our lives in this world to be able to be able to enjoy your presence and that of your son forever. We give you the praise in his precious name. Amen. We're going to turn to 349. I don't know if you remember when we were reading through Ezekiel that at one point the Lord promised to bring showers of blessing. 
that's what this hymn is about, 349. And think about the words. We used to sing this just mindlessly almost, just because the tune was fun and interesting. But think about what this is. This is asking the Lord for his blessing, like raindrops falling on a dry land. And boy, how we need his blessing. There shall be showers of blessing. This is the promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing, sent from the Savior above. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reviving again. Over the hills and the valleys, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling. But for the showers we plead, there shall be showers of blessing. Send them upon us, O Lord. Grant to us now a refreshing. Come and now honor thy word. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, oh that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we bleed. a reminder what Paul said there in Ephesians, that every spiritual blessing comes from above in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thankful for that word. Let's take our Bibles and look in John chapter 10. And... Uh, my subject is Christ the door. We're going through the D's now with regard to the depictions of Christ and his work. And there's no greater portion of scripture than right here in John chapter 10. I know initially you might think, well, what's difficult to understand? Christ the door. He's the way in. That's it. But we're going to find out there's a whole lot more what it means for Christ to be the door. I'll read here from verse 1 down to verse 10 and then make some comments. Very verily I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. That's why I say there's more to this than just saying, well, he's the door. <clears throat> then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. 
by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. So our passage here begins with verily, verily, truly, truly. It's amazing that the Lord is the truth, and yet he says, truly, truly, I say unto you. And you have to connect this with the previous chapter where the Pharisees had opposed the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember there in John chapter 9 and verse 34, they had excommunicated a beggar to whom the Lord had given sight. And so the mention of the sheep toll here in verse 1 is in connection with the Jewish sheepfold. That's important to understand here so we don't get confused. When the Lord said, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold. So the reference here to thieves and robbers, it says the same is a thief and a robber. Well, we know that the, there's no thieves or robbers that can en enter in and climb over the wall into Christ's sheepfold. So here, the reference to thieves and robbers climbing up some other way denounced the Pharisees. That's really what the Lord was doing here. Next to, so you can put sheepfold, that's the Jewish sheepfold. And the thieves and the robbers are references to these religious leaders of the day. What the Lord is doing is rebuking them for unlawful conduct. Here they claim to be authorities over the sheep, and yet they were not even coming through the door of the Jewish sheepfold or coming in a way that the law prescribed. When you think about this sheepfold, Think of what the law prescribed. They were robbers and they were thieves. And so the reason why many times we have problems maybe understanding what our Lord is teaching is here because in reality, if you notice as I was reading it, that there are actually three doors and it's important to keep these apart. The first door in verse 1, is into the sheepfold. So that's talking about the door into the Jewish fold. In verse 7, you notice it's called the door of the sheep. And that's who Christ is. He's not the door of the sheepfold, of the Jewish sheepfold. He entered in. When it says, he that entered in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. What the Lord is saying there is he came to claim his sheep out of Judaism, out of that Jewish sheepfold, and to call out those that were his. They weren't all his that were Jews, but he came to call out those that were. So that's why verse 7 says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. But then thirdly, down in verse 9, he repeats and says, I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. There he's revealing himself as the door of salvation. You've got the door of the sheepfold, the Jewish sheepfold. You've got the door of the sheep. That's who Christ is. Came to, and then the door of salvation. And that you can connect up with what Christ said in John 14, 6. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And so, beginning there in verses 1 and 2, he is describing that he actually entered in by the door. Christ didn't come to set the law aside. He came to fulfill it. These Pharisees that claimed to be the owners of the sheepfold, what were they doing? Climbing in over the walls and coming in any way they could to fleece the sheep. That's all their interest was. But when it says here that 
he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Christ did not set aside the law in order to save his sheep. Now the Pharisees accused him of it. They accused him of, of not fulfilling the law, but really they were accusing him of not giving credence to their laws. And so the, the issue here is between Christ and the Pharisees, especially in light of their antagonism toward him over that blind man that he had healed. They're already <clears throat> seeking to put him to death. And that's when the Lord begins to talk in parables here. Remember, parables were not for those that were outside. They listened to this and were clueless as to what he was saying, other, other than that they did understand. See, the, the, the term for a shepherd of the sheep, that was reserved for God alone in the Old Testament. And they were understanding what he was saying, that he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. The simple meaning of this is that Christ presented himself to Israel. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But he came in a lawful manner. He didn't set aside one aspect of the Old Testament law that was given by God himself, but he entered in by the door in a very strict obedience in accord with the Holy Scriptures. He submitted himself to all the conditions that were established by him that built the house. Well, who built the house? God did. He's the owner. They didn't recognize him as that. And so he entered in, and that's how he presented himself. He was born of a virgin, given for a covenant people. He was of the Judaic stock. He was a Jew of, of Jews of the seed of David, of the royal city of Bethlehem, and he had conformed to everything that God the Father required of him as an Israelite. He was born under the law. Isn't that what Paul said there in Galatians 4 and verse 4? He was circumcised the eighth day. That's why he entered in the temple. And he was presented to God in that temple there in Luke 2, 22. So now in verse 3, so he had every right to enter in. That's what he's saying. So in verse 3, it says to him, the porter openeth. Now there's all kinds of commentary about who this porter is to whom the door was opened. But remember, this is the opening of the door into the Jewish sheepfold. We know who opens the door when it comes to entering into salvation. The, the door of salvation, that's the Spirit of God. But here I believe, keeping everything in its context, it's none other than John the Baptist. Is John the Baptist not the forerunner? Did he not present Christ to Israel? Did he not declare, behold, the Lamb that taketh away the sin of the world? He was opening the door of the sheepfold, the Jewish sheepfold, to none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I believe there can be no doubt that this is a direct reference to John the Baptist. What, why was John the Baptist sent? To prepare the way of the Lord. That's what was declared there in Malachi. And that's what he did. He's the one that formally introduced the shepherd to Israel. Christ remained in obscurity until that moment, in that time. And then when John was baptizing there by the Jordan, that's when Christ came to him and told him that it was necessary that he be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. It's not that Christ needed baptism for any kind of repentance. He had no sin, but... It was a type and picture. The immersion was a type and picture of the very work that he came to accomplish. And if you look in John chapter 1 and verse 31, in this context, I believe you'll see why I say that the porter here is none other than John the Baptist. 
here in verse 31, it says, And I knew him not. So when John was growing up, he was our Lord's cousin physically, marrying Elizabeth, being sisters. But here it says that I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. So there's the portal. That through him he should be manifest to Israel. And to him the porter openeth. And the sheep hear his voice. Remember that's when they began to come to Christ. And when he declared, behold the Lamb of God. That's when a number started following after him. So first he entered the fold by the door. That's how Christ did. In a legitimate manner. According to the law, do you realize that Christ was 30 years old when he was manifest publicly to Israel? If you go back and look under the law, that's when a priest would enter into the ministry at 30 years of age. There's not, nothing there that was just happenstance. Every detail was according to the law. So he first entered the fold by the door. He didn't climb in over the walls as the thieves and robbers did. He didn't secretly come and try to steal away certain followers. Now they accused him of that. They accused Christ of being a conspirator. That was their accusation. And that he was gathering people after him to uh, overthrow the Roman government. Those were lies. That's not why Christ came. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Those that the Father had given him. But... Second, he entered the door by the porter, opening it to him. He's, John the Baptist was the forerunner. Christ was in the shadow until he was presented by the porter. And then thirdly, he proved himself by the sheep, recognizing and responding to his voice. And uh, how perfectly then these requirements are met by Christ in his relationship to Israel and thus evidencing that he was that true shepherd indeed. There's a lot more we could look at there, but let's come back here to my text in verse 4. 4. So, to him the porter openeth, the sheep hear his voice, and notice he calls his own sheep by name. So out of the midst of the Jewish fold, Christ is calling out his sheep by name. Who are they? Well, those are the ones that the Father gave him. For whom the Lord Jesus Christ prayed in the garden before he went to the cross. These sheep then would be the elect of God from among Israel. We know as you read on further in John chapter 10, Christ said, other sheep I have, verse 16, that are not of this fold. What fold is he talking about? The Jewish fold. <clears throat> and he says, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. <clears throat> so that does away then with the Jewishness and the, the history of God keeping that Jewish nation, because when Christ came now, there was a new fold established. It was... Christful, sheep from every tribe, nation, and tongue for whom Christ paid the debt. But verse 4, four when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. There are different types of calls that you see in Scripture. There's a general call, but many hear it, but they don't hear it. And then there's a special call, here it says, when he put it forth, his own sheep. Who's going to hear the voice of Christ? Who is it that's going to follow him and come out of that religion? That sheepfold, that Jewish sheepfold, remember, it, it's a representation of religion, man's religiosity. And uh, the Lord graciously calls them out. He says, the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Link this up with that third clause in the previous verse. 
he calleth his own sheep by name, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. There are a number of great illustrations that we could look at in Scripture that are found scattered throughout the Gospels where this was so. I think about starting with Matthew. What was Matthew? He was a tax collector and hated him. He sat there at the entrance of the city and when people brought their goods to market, he taxed them and he kept a good portion. He gave a portion to Rome. He was hated. And while he was sitting there at the table, remember there in Matthew 9 and verse 9, when the Lord passed by, what did he say to him? Follow me. That's all he had to say, follow me. And the scriptures say he arose and followed him. Here was a lone sheep of Christ. There were many others busy about their business that day, but the Lord called him, and uh, he recognized his voice promptly and followed him. Remember Zacchaeus? We could go through all of these stories. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. <laughs> Climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. We learned those little hymns when we were, were kids without really understanding, but you you put it in this context here. He was one of the sheep called by name. Zacchaeus, come down. What did he say? Today salvation has come to thy house. He was of that sheepfold. He was of that Jewish sheepfold. And, uh, you know, all the rest we could say with regard to the disciples. There in John 1 and verse 43, when Jesus was going into Galilee, he, it says he found Philip. Philip didn't find him. He found Philip. And all he said there, if you want to see it there in John 1, 43, all he said was, follow me. What does this show but that when the Lord Jesus Christ came, he was on a mission seeking the sheep. He wasn't trying to save everybody or get everybody saved. He was seeking the sheep and those he found he called. He came to seek and to what? Save that which was lost. Not try to save, save. So all of this we have examples of. Lazarus, you know, he was dead and yet the Lord called him forth. Lazarus, come forth. That's that effectual call. A lot of people read this word, might even be hearing me preach right now and it goes right over their, their heads. But those that God has given to his son as sheep, wherever they might be. These were in that Jewish fold of religion, yet it was the Lord calling them out, that effectual call. That's what Proverbs talks about, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. Proverbs 20 and verse 12, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made both of them. But notice that the call comes only to the sheep. It's not to the goats. Goats are never here. They're left to themselves. But, and that's, that's what, in, again, in John 10, we're only dealing with the first 10 verses. This whole chapter is so powerful. But when you get to John 10 and verse 26, look what the Lord says there. Ye believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. He didn't say, well, since you don't believe, I guess you're not my sheep. No, you believe not because you're not of my sheep. They're left to themselves. That effectual call comes only to those that are the Lord's. Now going on in verse five then, here the Lord specifically says, and a stranger will they not follow. For some time that puzzled me a little bit because I remember for years, even though I was a sheep and one of God's elect, I did follow strangers, but not for long. I believe that's the sense here, that when the Lord comes to call on, you're not going to continue to follow a stranger or somebody that does not point you to the Lord Jesus Christ. There are false shepherds, and I dare say to my shame, I was once one of them until it pleased God to reveal Christ in me. You can't point sinners to somebody that you have never known, and you can't lead them to somewhere where you've not already been. 
You imagine a tour guide telling you, I'll take you there. I've been on those kinds before. Just take your money. And you wander around for a while and you never do get to the destination. If you've traveled in some foreign countries, there's a lot of these types of tourist guides that, I'll take you. And they haven't got a clue. Well, sadly, there, there's a lot that way. That's who Christ describes there in verse 5. A stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. When will they flee? When they hear his voice. And I dare say that any of us that the Lord has taught, we can look back and see how he drew us out and we have fled from anything that is associated with false religion. Why? Because we received an unction from the Holy One, like John talks about in 1 John 2.20. And how thankful we should be for this, that the Lord has not left us to ourselves. So verse 6, this is a parable that Christ spake to them. And again, the reason is that the blind remain blind. They, the Pharisees, could not understand. When it says they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them, the context is these Pharisees that he's addressing. And uh, the same is true today of people that have the Bible, they read it, and yet Christ is not the one that they seek. Why? Because until the Spirit of God reveals Christ in you and shows you this word from begin to end pertains to him, you'll wander around blindly, taking the hand of anybody that, that will lead you. And so, just as the Pharisees were blind, equally blind today, are the leaders of religion. They might be well educated. There was once a man that they called in the walking Bible because he had memorized literally the whole Bible. That was the mind the Lord gave him. But when I listen to him and his message and what he preached, I have no hope that he ever knew the Lord, never, never was taught the Lord, because all he preached was, you better make your decision for Jesus. He's already done all he can do, now it's up to you. That's, that's not the gospel. But it's to say you can be educated and you can memorize Scripture and still miss Christ, as these did. When it says he came unto his own, his own received him not, they missed Christ all the way to the end. And therefore, unless you're born again, the word of God is a sealed book, as it was for me, until it pleased God to reveal Christ in me. So verse 7, we come down to, toward the end here. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. So now we're moving off of the door of the sheepfold to him addressing his sheep particularly those that the father gave him and the door of the sheep again is to be distinguished from there in verse 1 the door of the sheepfold and uh, the door of the sheep is none other than Christ himself the door of the sheepfold is Judaism and it's the law but here it pertains to Christ, by which those that were elect in Israel, they were not all Israel that were Israel, Paul said, but there were the elect of Israel that he brought out of Judaism. And that our Lord didn't come to establish Judaism or restore Judaism. That's what's so horrible, horrible about this prophecy that says God's going to come back and begin to work again with the Jews and rebuild the foundation that's already been destroyed and put up another temple in Jerusalem and Christ come sit in a physical seat there in Jerusalem. No, that's not why he came. In fact, he going to the cross said, your house is left to you desolate. When they cried, his blood be upon us and our children, it was and is to this day. Now our Lord went outside the camp. That's where he was crucified outside the gates of Jerusalem. It's because he didn't come to try to reestablish Israel's preeminence that they'd had back in, in the day. No, he came to establish a whole new house, a whole new people, a new Israel. And so 
That's why he says in verse 8, all that ever came before me are thieves and robbers. Again, addressing these false shepherds that should have been, had they been reading the scriptures aright, would have been telling the people to wait for the coming of this one. And when he came, they would have said like John the Baptist, Behold the Lamb! <clears throat> That's an amazing statement right there. All of those lambs from the beginning of the fall, when God first killed those innocent victims, all the way to this time, behold the Lamb! That's who it represented. But these false teachers, all they were interested in was keeping people under their thumb and under their rule. That's why John the Baptist said of them, of the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, you blind guides that strain at a gnat and swallow at a camel, always debating about this law and that law. He called them a, a generation of vipers. He said, how can you escape the damnation of hell that is to come? Why would the Lord even refer to the Pharisees here as he did in the verse 1, without mentioning them by name, but here in verse 8, why, why does he refer to them as thieves and robbers? Because that's what they are. They were lawyers. They boasted themselves of knowing the law, and yet they did not point their followers to Christ. And so you say, what's the difference between a thief and a robber? The word for thief that is used here uh, speaks of a person using stealth. If a thief is getting ready to rob you, then he, he look, uses stealth to come in and steal. And that's how people fall prey to preachers. They go out and they call it evangelizing, it's proselytizing, but when they're done, they become twice full of the child of the devil. And the people don't even perceive that they're false preachers. They use stealth. That's what the word thief means. And the word for robber is one that uses violence. When you take men and their souls and you draw them away from Christ, you are doing damnation to their souls. It's as if you're killing them. And, that, and that's who these are, is robbers, thieves and robbers. And I know people look at them and think, well, he's just such a good preacher. Well, that's part of the deception. Unless they're pointing you to Christ, they're nothing but thieves and robbers. And so, wrapping it up here in verse 9, when the Lord says, I am the door by me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. Here, then is Christ presenting himself as the door of salvation. One door. He's the God-appointed way for salvation. It wasn't in Judaism. It wasn't in the works of the law. No, he came to redeem those that were under the law. He's the way out of Judaism. A lot of people want to still try to put you back under the law today. That's why Paul said, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free. This door is a door of freedom because it's a door of salvation. And he says, I am the door. This is one of those I ams. I am the good shepherd. I am the door. I am with reference to him being Jehovah God. And uh, He's the way out of false religion and the way into salvation because it's by his work. When he came, he earned and established that righteousness necessary that God might be just to justify, declare righteous everyone for whom he paid the debt. And when it says there that, <clears throat> that he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture, oh, the blessed pastures, the green pastures, reminds me of Psalm 23, feeding on Christ. That's the sheep's food. That's what they need. They can't brute like goats chewing on cans and other things. They're, a sheep's mouth isn't made like a goat's. It needs still waters and it needs fresh, plain, comfortable pasture. But that's what the Lord does to feed his own. And when it says there, he shall be saved, it's because this is the Lord's work to do from beginning to end.
as he says in verse 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal. They don't care about your soul. To kill, to destroy, but I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Life is in Christ. It's through him, through his finished work that he accomplished there on Calvary. And uh, he's going to have everyone for whom he came. Well, that's a quick view of that. But I pray the Lord will continue to be our teacher. Let's take our hymn books and we'll close with hymn number 294. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Lead us. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us. Much we need thy tender care. In thy pleasant pastures feed us. For our use thy folds prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, thou hast bought us thine we are. We are thine, do thou be friends. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Thou hast promised to receive us for and simple mercy to relieve us, grace to cleanse and far to free. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn to Thee. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, early let us turn Next time, over.